Hello, I am Joe W3GMS and I welcome you to my 2020 Hiram Percy Maxim virtual presentation. As you will learn from this presentation, Hiram Percy Maxim was a contributor in so many ways, both in and out of amateur radio. Hiram Percy Maxim, known as HPM in my presentation, was known as the beloved gentleman. I firmly believe that if it was not for HPM, amateur radio would not exist today. Sit back and enjoy my Hiram Percy Maxim presentation. Hiram Percy Maximum, Mr. Amateur Radio, the beloved gentleman. Hi, I'm Joe, W3GMS, and I hope you enjoy my HPM presentation. As you'll notice from this slide, HPM had a relatively short lifespan from September 2nd, 1869 to February 17th, 1936, for a total of 67 years. So I am 68 years old, so... Um, and that has gone incredibly fast. So uh, he was one year younger than I when he passed. So uh, to me, that seems like a very short lifespan. Now we see a dapper picture of HPM. There's many pictures that uh, portray him in different facets over his life. But I kind of like I kind of like this portrait. I thought he looked well respected and uh, was uh, deserving. Okay, a few things up front about the presentation. Um, the goals of my presentation when I started doing it is the uh, presentation will discuss Hiram Percy Maxim's life. And I must say it's impossible to do justice without going into the history of his accomplishments, both in and out of amateur radio. And as I go through the presentation, I think it'll be really clear of why that is the case. I always had this notion that, uh, yeah, he and Clarence Tuska started the league and and that's what he did. He went to the league every day and did his thing, but he was doing so many things before, after, and during that it was just uh, just incredible. Uh, most of my source material came from an extremely well-written book uh, titled Hiram Percy Maxim by uh, Alice Clank Schumacher. And uh, all my credits and everything are at the end of this presentation, so you'll see where I got my uh, overall material from. But uh, by far, her book was the primary source with a few fill-ins from Internet and other books and things like that. And I try to differentiate. You'll see through the presentation, there's one section where the fonts are a different color. And that's to uh, align that color with the credits at the back. That was the easiest way for me to do it. And um, there's another section where the uh, the font is actually tilted a little bit to the right. And uh, that also uh, denotes and helps identify the source of where that material came from. Uh, I have some expectations of uh, all of you, and I try to do my best. So when you're done this presentation... Yeah, you will fully respect HPM and the genius both within and outside of amateur radio. And I can honestly say uh, that without Harm Percy Maxim, which I abbreviate in most cases through this, uh, this slideshow as HPM, uh, and he constantly stood up for radio amateurs, uh, not only at the national level, but the international level. Amateur radio as we know it today would likely not exist. I mean, he fought for the frequencies. He fought for the rights. He fought for all kinds of aspects of amateur radio. And from my research, he really never lost any of his um, things that he wanted to pursue for the hobby. So more about that as we get into the pr presentation. And, you know, as I went through and I was reading these different books on, on HPM, what amazed me was his diversity. Uh, you know, oftentimes people with ex exceedingly high intellect up in the genius category, which he definitely was, um, you know, they're very good at certain things and they're like 90 dB down and other things. But that was not the case. He was very diversified and his knowledge extended 
uh, in many, many different uh, areas. And you'll see that as we uh, as we go along here. So you may ask, who was Hiram Percy Maxim? Well, he was the, his father was Hiram Stevens Maxim, who had less than five years of formal education. He was also regarded as a genius, uh, held many, many, many patents, and was just a very competent individual. Uh, he studied science and engineering while traveling around the country, working at various odd jobs. So he would kind of make money, and while he was out in these different parts of the country, with his odd jobs, he would uh, he would study uh, science and engineering primarily. Uh, most notable, and you know, is written about in a lot of different uh, spots. Uh, he was and credited with the famous invention of the uh, fully automatic and uh, machine gun, known as the Maxim gun. And uh, he developed that, and that was a very successful, revolutionary kind of product that had uh, widespread use in military applications primarily. He was a senior partner in the firm Maxim and & Welsh, and what they made were steam engines and gas generating machines. So uh, pretty interesting guy. We'll learn about him a little bit more uh, into the presentation. HPM early pioneering work was in gliders, uh, automobiles, air cleaning, air cooling, and way back in the early, very early days, he envisioned radio and television. And HPM himself uh, probably inherited all those good genes, a lot of those good genes from his father. But he started MIT uh, at the age of 14, and he graduated at age 16. And back then, uh, MIT had a two-year engineering program. I'm not sure that they offered a four-year program. The, the impression that I got is if you went to uh, MIT for electrical engineering, it was a two-year program. Uh, first engineering job for HPM uh, as a practicing engineer at age 17. And he worked for the Jenny Electric Company and the W.S. Electric Company at age 19 in 1888. To give you kind of a time reference, he became engineering superintendent for the American uh, Projectile Company. And you think about it, at 19 years old, he was a superintendent, an engineering superintendent. Three years, right? Graduated age 16, 19, he was already an engineering superintendent for the American Projectile Company. That's pretty impressive unto itself. And he also had a very strong interest in uh, planetary observation. And uh, he foretold uh, things about the space age, very much a visionary on that as well. And uh, later on, we'll, we'll learn about the work he did on Mars. So uh, he was very, very interested in that. Okay, now we come to, so who was Hiram Percy Maxim? HPM on September 8th, 1998, uh, got engaged to Josephine Hamilton, who was a daughter of the former governor of Maryland. Uh, the wedding took place on December 21st, 1898. And I have to say, she really became his soulmate. A lot of these trips that he traveled internationally and nationally, uh, she went along uh, with him to support the work he was doing. So she was uh, a pretty special lady. And it was interesting because um, prior to their engagement, they would sit down and talk about philosophies. And um, they would share thoughts and everything like that. And HPM was kind of say, yeah, is this is this lady really going to be? Are we, how are we going to get to get along? And is she kind of on the same page with some things that I'm thinking about? So I guess that session, those sessions went well because ultimately they did get uh, they did get married. And I called him the he was the father and savior of amateur radio, and I firmly believe that he was an inventive genius by inheritance. 
In all, uh, 59 patents were issued in his name in many of the mechanical arts. And there's some other sources out there that that have some claims that he was up in the 80 uh, number of 80 patents and things like that. But the 59 patents is the one that I could verify. So he had many, many, many patents. He was an authority on acoustics. Uh, humanity is indebted to him for as many developments that will make complex urban life more bearable. And that's an interesting one. And, you know, sometimes you don't think about a radio guy, as we know him, uh, being involved in these things. So humanity, acoustics, um, it's, it's really uh, it's really interesting. He was an enthusiast. He had a lot of enthusiasm on motion pictures. Uh, he was an amateur in motion pictures and uh, gave to this field the same art and support that he did uh, to amateur radio. Uh, it was in 1926 he had noticed the same necessity for an organization in this field that he had previously noted in amateur radio, and as a result of the uh, personal effort. Uh, there came into being the Amateur Cinnamon League, an amateur organization similar to the structure of ARL, of which he was also the founder and president. Continuing HPM in the early years, as a young boy, uh, he, he the book always noted that he would run everywhere. Uh, if he was going up and down the steps, he would take two steps at a time. And he seemed to always be in a hurry. It was interesting. So uh, I don't think he ever fell. So I guess he had that mastered pretty well. Uh, he and his father, and mainly his father, uh, just loved to pull pranks on him, on his son, on HPM, which sometimes absolutely drove um, HPM's mother nuts. They would do all kinds of things. But a couple examples uh, one day, HPM uh, noticed that there was no peaches on the family peach tree. So his father told his son to, to, to find a dead cat and bury it under the tree. And if he did that, it would be loaded with peaches. Clearly, this was just a prank. So I guess HPM went out in the alleys and the back, back roads. And lo and behold, because of his sheer uh, persistence, he found a, uh, a dead cat. So, um, so he buried it under the tree. And uh, <laughs> so that night, uh, after he came home from school, guess what? The tree was loaded with peaches. His father, Hiram Stevens Maxim, judiciously uh, put peaches, attached peaches to all the branches of that tree. And HPM was just amazed. And another one, it was kind of interesting. HPM, as a very young boy, would get down to the uh, uh, a general type store that was kind of local to them, and uh, he would go down and talk to the proprietor. And he, there was a the, the proprietor had a dog, and uh, I guess HPM would talk to this dog, and he started really, really liking this dog, and ultimately uh, he decided he wanted the dog, so he pestered the owner. And the owner says, no, that's my dog. I want to keep the dog. But finally, the owner said, and he did this out of jest because he thought that HPM would no way come through with this. But he said, you find me a penny with two heads on it, of which they made none. Um, you can have my dog. So HPM, you know, being very, very young, he went through all everybody's change purse and he kept looking for this um this penny with two heads. And after weeks of looking for this, he, he just couldn't find one. So he asked his father. His father said, what are you doing? Well, I'm looking for a penny with two heads so I can get this dog. So his father could see the frustration in HPM's eyes. So uh, his father went to work that day and had the machine shop take, take two pennies and slice them down the middle and then put make a new penny with two heads and attach it together, buff it and everything. And you really could not distinguish this from a, um, a two-headed 
conventionally manufactured penny. <laughs> so uh, HPM kind of thought, this is great. I have, I finally, I finally, my dad found a two-headed penny. So he goes running down to the store where the owner is with the dog. And uh, HPM's father said, you know, he kind of knew how this was going to turn out. He had the wisdom to know that. He said, I better go with you. So he went down. Well, of course, the owner said, this is fake. They never made such a thing. And he reneged on the deal. And, uh, and at that point in time, the owner got quite a tongue lashing from HBM's dad because he believed a commitment was a commitment. And indeed, his son did bring him a two-headed penny. So uh, it was an interesting one on that. And there was many, many, many other stories uh, along similar lines. So HPM had a wonderful relationship with his father, Hiram Stevens Maxim, until at age 15. And that's when his father moved to France. And I'm not really sure what um, perpetuated that move to France, but he moved to France. And he left the family back, uh, back here. So uh, following that move, they really did not have any contact with each other. His father did, a few years later, request it that the family move to France, but that, that just never happened. So very sad, but from the time HPM was age 15 and up, he really had no more contact with his father. And it seemed like their childhood was, was really, really a fun, kidding, and good one. So all that, all that ended. Continue on HPM style. Uh, HPM, Harm Percy Maxim was known for great organization and unselfishness. They were two of his uh, guiding principles that really, really helped guide him through his entire life. Uh, his lectures were very witty, and he also had an intense concentration on subjects that interested him. And his interest was not really focused in just one or two areas. His interest fell in a lot of different interest buckets. And whatever those interest buckets were at the time, he just really worked hard and intensely concentrated uh, on those uh, different uh, things that he was working on. He never really quit. He would take things through to their fruition and then determine if they had any practical value. But at least he worked all the elements through to be able to make that decision. He was a man of kindness and sincerity uh, and a, for a great love of life. And uh, because of that, I think uh, that principle, he was really known among his peers as the beloved gentleman. So it was many times in various source material that I read that I read the term beloved gentleman. And that's really was uh, what he was known as. And uh, one of his greatest satisfactions, of course, came from amateur radio. And uh, he most enjoyed working with young folks with modest to no means. And he had a phrase that he, he would say about that. He says, the hardest working among us are those that work with their brains and what drives us to our incurable ambition to be something, to accomplish something. So, uh, and that was true. And... Uh, the folks that worked with him, uh, because of uh, his goals, HPM's goals, I'm sure that they were uh, mentored along those lines to operate in a similar uh, methodology. Mr. Maxim was one of the very early pioneers in the development of the automobile. In 1886, he was employed by the Jenny Electric Company, located in Fort Wayne, Indiana, as an electrical engineer at age 17. During 1887 and 1888, HPM worked as an engineer for the W. Hill Electric Company out of Boston. And then in 1888, at age 19, he became the engineering superintendent for the American Projectile Company in Lynn, Mass., uh, knowing nothing of the famous Selden patent, he designed an internal combustion engine and experimented with it and eventually mounted it upon a second-hand tandem tricycle. And this work led to the contract with Pope Manufacturing Company of Hartford, famous early manufacturers of bicycles. 
And then he developed the Connecticut's first motor coach on October 1895. And Maxim was the first driver of that. Mr. Maxim moved to Hartford to become manager of the new motor carriage department of the Pope Manufacturing Company. As a result, there came into existence the famous Columbia Automobiles. First gasoline, later electric. Designed and built under HPM's direction. He also had the distinction of participating in what was probably the first automobile race in America between his Columbia and a Stanley. Both pitifully inadequate devices over a distance of five miles. But Mr. Maxim won the race. In 1901, HPM was selected to drive one of the Pope's company's gasoline vehicles uh, to the Pan American Expo in Buffalo, New York. His wife, Josephine, accompanied him on the trip. Due to President McKinley's shooting death, the event was canceled. But Hiram and Josephine did successfully complete the run to Buffalo, New York. In 1903, HPM and his wife, who were previously living in Pittsburgh, returned to living in Hartford. He resumed his old post with the electric vehicle company as their chief engineer. During 1906, HPM went into business with a good friend, Thaddeus Goodrich, which was also his best man at his wedding. The company was to produce and market electric vehicles. As you can see, HPM was really interested in uh, early gliders. So in 1909, he built the Maxim Glider, and George Lucas was his first pilot. It was towed by a four-cylinder engine, auto, uh, from the electric vehicle company. And um, the, the, the flight of this early glider was over Hartford Meadows, which is the present site of Brainfart Field. And Mr. Maxim is seen on crutches at the left uh, front portion of the photograph that you see. You see that crutch uh, being supported by that individual, and that's HPM. Um, and he had a crutch because he had a, uh, a glider crash, and he injured that knee. Uh, he was intensely interested in aviation. And as a glider enthusiast, he badly injured a knee in a glider accident in his younger years. He was one of the originators of the Aero Club of Hartford and for many years chairman of the Hartford's Aviation Commission. Uh, he was the man who first envisioned Hartford's uh, municipal aviation port. And uh, Brainford Field uh, is where W1MK was located. So it's kind of interesting that uh, W1MK which uh, was the ARL station before it was W1AW, uh, was located. So, interesting. And here you can see a picture of uh, HPM um, uh, driving the Columbia gas carriage uh, designed by HPM, who was a credit as an automotive a pioneer. Uh, and this machine won the first automobile track race held in America at Brantford, Connecticut in 1899. And as mentioned, uh, you can see HPM at the controls looking, looking dapper. Okay, now we're getting into uh, HPM's achievement uh, prior to amateur radio. Um, and after this, we'll get into the amateur radio. But this is all the interesting things he was involved in prior to getting involved in amateur radio. And HPM really disliked loud noises, and he felt that they were a major uh, health deterrent. And he also, uh, because of that, he developed a gun silencer in 1908. So 1908 is when his famous gun silencer was developed. And if you Google up HPM, the first thing that will come up is he was the inventor of the gun silencer. So he's really, really known for that. It was a break, uh, breakthrough product that branched into many new develops for him. Uh, the silencer um, was developed by watching water swirling uh, going down a bathtub drain. So by watching that water swirl, uh, that's how he got the idea for the silencer. So from 1902 to uh, through 1909, 
he was very busy focusing on inventing, building, marketing, and selling uh, firearm silencers, uh, which he invented. Um, and it was interesting because not one to sit still, and you can imagine his business was just booming, but he developed mufflers for the internal combustion engine uh, using similar technologies as his gun silencer. Um, a silencer, which they called it back then for automobiles, which we know today as a muffler, for a Model T Ford cost $6 in 1912. And that was, that was a lot of money in 1912, $6. So in 1912, uh, he expanded the silencer business into many fields, including steam engine and boat engines. And he was responsible for the steering wheel being put on the left side of the American automobile. So that's another thing that a lot of people never realized. And um, he won the first track race in the U.S., uh, being an automotive guy. And uh, he usually drove what he designed and developed, and he loved racing. So he won the first track race in the U.S. And all his inventions led the automotive industry um, into such things as multiple spline shafts, which he developed. Um, we mentioned the steering wheel on the left side. Uh, he solved many problems with uh, bearing wheel tires, uh, existing muffler issues, batteries, battery charging equipment, carburetors, spark plugs, and brakes. And 49 of his patents that he acquired were in automotive uh, products that were listed in his name. Now we get up to uh, HPM and amateur radio. Yes, what everybody's been waiting for. I thought the background information just to show his diversity and how many things he was involved in, even before he knew anything about amateur radio, was significant. So that's why it was presented. But in 1903, uh, he attended an important uh, scientific event that occurred in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, the event was the International Electrical Congress. And papers were presented which served to inspire many amateurs. So it was pretty early in 1903. So in 1909, January 2nd to be specific, uh, the first radio organization was formed. It was named the Junior Wireless Club of New York. That was in 1909. In 1911, the name changed to the Radio Club of America, which everybody will certainly recognize today. Um, so it, it changed to uh, the Radio Club of America. And um, there was really no mention of HPM being involved in the Radio Club of America, but I'm sure he was well aware of it. On January 24th, uh, 1910, Congress passed a bill requiring communication apparatus and operators on ocean liners. So they were saying, well, you know, for safety, we're really going to have to start putting uh, wireless apparatus equipment on ocean liners. So in 1911, HPM and his son Hamilton, who was 11 years old at the time, became amateur radio operators. So that was really his first introduction into amateur radio for HPM and his son Hamilton was 1911. And uh, I guess the inspiration came from a good friend, Roland Byrne, or Bourne. So HPM had many call signs in the early days. They were S N Y uh, W H one W H one Z M and one A W. And the one A W one ultimately uh, became W one A W, and the rest on that is history. We'll talk about that. And uh, a lot of the other calls were before uh, they were assigned a letter, which preceded the number. Uh, it was quite interesting. The first transmitter that HPM built, which was a spark affair, uh, covered one city block. <laughs> and But one year later, it covered five miles. So that was gone from one city block to five miles. That was uh, that was almost DX back in back in the early days of radio. Wireless operation during the early uh, 1900s was uh, very disorganized, extremely disorganized. And uh, it was this disorganization that, uh, that caused just major issues. 
pretty much you could get on the air with anything you had. You could do any power, any frequency. There was no limitations. Any type of transmitter was the name of the game. So it was kind of bedlam. And uh, the bedlam increased as uh, more amateurs got on and more commercial services got on and things like that. So there was uh, serious conflicts with the branches of the military services and the Department of Commerce. So on August uh, 9th, uh, 1912, the Radio Act passed with a signing uh, from then President William Taft uh, that amateur radio was not abolished, but re was restricted to 200 meters and below. So they figured they'll put them all the way over on the side, away from the commercial stuff, and life will be good. And HBM called this one of the most constructive and valuable bits of legislation that a Congress ever enacted because he, he had the envision of what capability the shortwave frequencies offered and by being on 200 meters and below uh, and now the shortwave uh, frequencies being available, uh, that was going to be a major, major asset to the uh, amateur radio operators. Um in 1913, there was a there was a devastating storm in Ohio and Michigan, and uh, the amateurs really came forth and helped with public service communications, and they really got a lot of accolades from the general public. So that was maybe one of the first times in history that amateur radio, um, the first early time in history that amateur radio uh, really got accolades for public service assistance. Then on January 14th, uh, 1914, uh, they had the first meeting of the Radio Club of Hartford. And presiding at the meeting was HPM and Clarence Tuska, who was appointed secretary. So then we get into Hiram Percy Maxim, HPM, and the Amateur Radio Relay League. So by August on 1914, uh, there were 200 designated relay stations. And evidently, these stations that were part of the relay structure were held in very high esteem. Uh, by September, uh, they were covering 32 states and Canada on their communication uh, circles. So on October 14th, uh, October uh, 1914, rather, uh, the club issued its first call book listing all radio amateur stations. And... Um, so it was really the numbers were coming up and the popularity and there was more and more stations on the air at all the time. So later in 1914, uh, Hiram Percy Maxim went to Washington, D.C. to confer with the commissioner of the navigation of the Department of Commerce. And the purpose of, uh, of that trip was to gain recognition uh, for the club in its official circles and to get special licenses for certain types of relaying stations. And uh, shortly thereafter, HPM uh, was trying to find some early vacuum tubes because with these shortwave frequencies available, the wheels were turning. <laughs> but, uh, but he couldn't find them locally. So he, instead, he built a 1KW spark transmitter so he could increase his range of communication. And that 1KW spark transmitter gave him a uh, maximum range of um, 100 miles and uh, and that's what HPM was using at that point in time. Arm Percy Maxim and the American Radio Relay League. Due to Spark having its range limitations, uh, HPM focused on relaying messages from station to station. And that started happening in uh, 1914. So with the uh, with vacuum tubes not being available, and Spark being the uh, chosen mode of the day, uh, if they were going to talk all across the country in different parts, they really had to re uh, rely on relay stations. So that was that was really established in 1914. And in 1914, HPM conceived of the name of the organization made up of relay stations. So he named this organization the American Radio Relay League. So that was really the first that... Um, that name surfaced was in 1914, which became the ARRL. On February of 1915, HPM left the Hartford Club and incorporated the American Radio Relay League. Remember, he liked organizations and uh, he liked to dot the I's and cross the T's. So uh, 
that's when uh, the American Radio Relay League was incorporated in uh, February of 1915. So now he had structure. He had an official organization. He became the founding father of the ARL and its associate publication, QST. And uh, later he was known as the genius behind QST. And QST kind of had a rocky start, mainly due to funding. So we'll get into that in a minute. But HPM brought uh, brought on Clarence Tusco board. Of course, he had experience with Clarence from the uh, Hartford Radio Club. And uh, he knew Clarence. He was a uh, young college student and evidently earned uh, Hiram Percy Maxim respect in, on more than one occasion. So we brought him on as the uh, first business manager of the ARL and QST. Um, and as mentioned, uh, Mr. Tusk at the time was a college student. So he was a young guy. The first problem starting QST was funds. So the initial issue of QST on December of 1915 was funded at the expense of HPM and Clarence Tusca. It was Tusca's uncle who designed the cover of the first issue of QST. And I know several years back, if you bought a handbook from the uh, from ARL, they had a reprint that they gave you free of charge that came along with the uh, the handbook. So I do have a copy of the uh, first issue of QST, but not an original, sadly. And my guess here is that Tusca, being a college student, my, my guess is that Hiram Percy Maxim put most of the uh, the money in the jar. <laughs> Because I don't think uh, uh, Clarence Tusca had a lot of extra cash at that point, being a, uh, a college student. Okay, here's the announcement in the first QST magazine of December 15th. Announcement. QST is published by at the expense of Harm Percy Maxim and Clarence D. Tusca. Its object is to help maintain the organization of the Amateur Radio Relay League and to keep the amateur wireless operators of the country in constant touch with each other. Every amateur will help himself and help his fellows by sending in 25 cents for a three months trial subscription. Can you imagine 25 cents and you got three issues? And uh, that was uh, that was put in the uh, December 15th, 1915 issue of uh, of QST. And look how far they've gone. <laughs> HPM is the founding father of the ARL and its publication, QST, wrote its chief editorials. On January 17, 1917, HPM was a leading participant in a transcontinental relay. Moving along to February 6th of the same year, 1917, a message was relayed between the East Coast to the West Coast which took 80 minutes. And that may sound like a long time, but when you have a bunch of stations operating from station to station to station, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty miraculous for 1917. In February 1917, the ARL was more formalized with expanding its governing structure, adopting a constitution, and outlining policies. Remember, HPM liked organizations and structure. On April 1917, all amateur stations were shut down to the World War I. Uh, the House of Representatives were proposing that all radio communication, including amateurs, be turned over to the Navy. Well, HPM didn't think too much of that, so he heads off to Washington to rally against having amateurs con coming under the control of the Navy. And largely due to HPM efforts, this bill was killed in committee. And uh, HBM had quite uh, a lot of clout with Washington because they often came to him for training and other things and favors and when it dealt with radio communications because a lot of the amateurs were way, way ahead of some of the, uh, the uh, military communication uh, operators. So uh, this, this, uh, they relied on the ARL for many things and this, uh, this served the ARL very, very well. So uh, also, HPM was contacted by Washing, and there was a big shortage of radio operators and equipment for World War I. 
So the situation was resolved both from a manpower and equipment standpoint. Over 4,000 amateurs uh, served during World War I, and private amateur radio gear was converted for wartime usage. So they got more uh, kudos over that because they really filled a very, very big need. Interestingly enough, not to sit idle, uh, during the war, HPM's home was set up for radio training classes for ladies. And Josephine, which was, uh, which was Hiram Percy Maxim's wife, uh, was enrolled. And code was taught with a buzzer and key. And this was the first wireless organ- organization founded by women in this country. So that was, uh, was pretty interesting. Clarence Tuska enlisted in the war effort, and uh, it's interesting because HPM would write to him similar to how a father would uh, send a note to his son. You know, Clarence being uh, considerably younger than Hiram Percy Maxim. Hiram Percy Maxim almost acted in the capacity of his father at times. And uh, HPM advised him uh, not to get involved in youthful things and to maintain himself in high esteem. That doesn't sound like that sound like a father's lecture. <laughs> In another uh, letter, HPM mentioned that he uh, found a better antenna location, uh, and that was on his his property, but uh, was concerned what the neighbors would think of the skyline with the new antenna apparatus in place. So, boy, doesn't that sim- sound familiar? Some things never change, right? Um, another letter that HPM sent uh, Clarence Tuska was about his safety during the war. So he, he wrote him quite regularly. Clarence uh, Tuska suggested to the Victor Phonograph Company uh, that they should come out with a CW record for practicing at 20 words a minute with static to simulate actual radio conditions. And uh, amateurs needed a way to keep up their CW skills while observing radio silence. Uh, Victor listened and did come out with a practical uh, practice type record that they could listen to. Uh, Harry Chadwich of the uh, Marconi Institute did the lesson plans. And HPM suggested to Tessa to come out with a higher quality version of what Victor had done. Because evidently HPM wasn't really happy with the quality of what uh, of what Victor uh, produced. <laughs> so you can see that entrepreneurial spirit, and I think a little bit of that stuck with Clarence because later he had his own radio design and manufacturing company. So on April sixteenth of nineteen eighteen, uh, HPM, which was using the call one ZM at that time, writes to Tusca which is one ZT that he is sad over the war effort uh, being the fact that it's taking so long and really miss getting on the air. Uh, When the war is going on, HPM is surveying his property for new antennas. Once the band has left it and HPM, it was considering ground signals to keep his hand on the key. So uh, that's when they actually tried to send signals through the ground and for very local communications and things like that. And I guess uh, HPM was severely having uh, operating withdrawal. (laughs) So it's interesting. And I'm sure that happens with a lot of hams a day when they're taking a tower down or maybe moving to another location. And it's a while before they get their their station uh, set up again. So you got to be an amateur radio operator to fully appreciate that. With Armistice Day declared on November 11th, 1918, the radio band continued. And, uh, you know, naturally all these amateurs are anxious to get it back on the air, but they had to wait till they could officially be granted the permission to do so. Uh, an attempt was made to give the Secretary of Navy control of all the radio in the U.S. HPM was selected to attend the hearing on the bill. Uh, the, de- the league developed what they called the blue card which was used by amateurs to appeal this bill. And HPM was the author of the card. And evidently, uh, they sent out many, many cards, and they got many, many appeals back there where they did not want the amateurs um, 
to give the uh, Secretary of the Navy control of all radio in the U.S. So once again, HPM went down. He had his blue cards and uh, the, the threatening bill died in committee. So that's just another example of how he influenced and uh, uh, controlled amateur radio in a way to, um, to serve well and continue its growth. And obviously he succeeded. On March of, of 1919, the league voted to resume publication of QST. The board members and HPM himself used their own money to produce the next issue of QST, since the league only at that time had $33 in their account. The ban on receiving equipment was lifted by the Navy on April 12th of 1919, but transmitting equipment was still not allowed. It was interesting that they, they left it. The re, you could listen, but you couldn't transmit yet. After much debate and consternation, on September 26th, 1919, the entire ban was lifted. The October 1919 QST made a big announcement. HPM credit the ARL as a major benefit in getting amateurs back on the air. Remember, HPM like the strength of an organization. And that was a maximum principle. Here's one of HPM's very early uh, stations at his home. So uh, it's a pretty good picture. I, it wasn't dated, so I'm not sure of the exact date. But you can tell by the look of some of the equipment that it was pretty, pretty, pretty early. On well, December uh, 1919, HPM participated in the first post-war transcontinental relay. He was assigned 1AW for that. So that's when 1AW appeared, 1919. The first QSL cards were introduced by QST by staff cartoonist Don Hoffman in 1919. HPM's own business was at a standstill after the war since there was no demand for uh, munitions. Uh, during this time frame, HPM's son, Hamilton, just graduated from MIT. So I guess he was following in his father's footsteps. And uh, he and just few others continued to work for the Maxim's uh, Silencer Company. Interesting uh, revolution here. Um, just going back to the silencer, this was interjected because it fit time frame wise in this uh, chronological path with HPM. But why HPM was in a hotel building in Milwaukee, it was very hot and noisy outside. And if he opened the window to cool down, the noise outside was so loud that he couldn't sleep. If he closed the window, it was too hot to sleep. Uh, due to that experience, he built and designed an air conditioning unit, which turned out to be a salvation uh, for his silencer company. So you can see the product uh, switch. He recognized a need. The silencer business was dropping down somewhat, so here, here he plugged in a new product, which he developed. In January of 1920, uh, the ARL had expanded into Canada. So their, uh, their footprint was not only in the U.S., but now up into Canada, which is a great thing. Uh, the July 1920 issue of QST featured HPM's antenna system on the cover. And this antenna uh, was two wires, 50 foot in length strung between two masts that were 80 foot high. So he almost, it's like he had vision that he was going to be operating the short wave frequencies with the uh, two 50 foot lengths of wire up there. ARL in 1920 adopted the official diamond shaped symbol and that's the symbol we know today. So that goes all the way back to 1920. In August of 1920, HPM received a formal invitation to attend the ceremonies for the Honorable Franklin D. Roosevelt for his nomination as Democratic candidate for the vice presidency of the United States. And that was held in uh, Hyde Park, New York. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting on that one. Um, and you can see how he always got these invitations with all these dignitaries and things like that. And that's because he was very, very well plugged in. And he, re he was represented at, uh, by a very large organization because ARL was growing. And uh, he got the invites. And uh, it was a good thing because that helped him out politically, I think, for amateur radio when he had to go to Washington and fight for frequencies and other things. 
HPM was a multi-talented guy, and he definitely proved his worth as a movie scriptwriter. It's kind of interesting how he got into this, but he had a bet with his sister, so he sought out to win the bet. He liked to win. You know, he liked to be successful. So in 1921, he wrote the script for a movie titled The Virgin Paradise. And this production was accepted by Fox Photoplay, and starring in the film was a well-known actress, Pearl White. On March 1921, HPM wrote a comedy, Miss Animator. And he had a uh, quite a knack for writing such things. So it's interesting. Here's a guy, you know, an inventor, scientist, engineer, all the labels you give him. And here's yet another talent he had. And he really enjoyed this. Uh, so in 1923, amateur radio was really changing due to the short ways and vacuum tubes, uh, due to vacuum tubes. And Spark continued to hold on for a few more years. On October of 1923, the third national radio conference took place in Washington, D.C. And these uh, conference were very pro-amateur radio. A committee was formed headed by HPM. See how he kind of HPM heads all these committees. So to study amateur radio problems. Some problems had international ramifications. The British in particular were concerned with some brashness coming from some of the younger amateurs. Soon, however, this situation took care of itself and everyone became accustomed to the new wave. So in 1923, same year, internationally, QST English was developed with various Q signals along with other brief ways to signify a meaning without spelling the entire statement. And as we all know in CW, it's, uh, it's very important to do that. It speeds up getting the point across. In the spring of 1923, Harm Percy Maxim was contacted by Captain Donald uh, McMillan, and they met uh, in Maxim home to work out the details for his next expedition to the Arctic region. So here you have these two greats, and, and HPM was known for his communication work. And Millen had this expedition, and he wanted to have communication on board. So what, what better person to contact than HPM? So as a result of all that, the schooner uh, Bodine uh, sets tail from Wisconsin, Maine, uh, with a, uh, a full 200-meter amateur radio station. So they hadn't, on that first expedition in 1923, um, they, uh, they were not up to the short wave frequencies yet, but a later, uh, expedition in 1925, they progressed to the short wave frequencies. But anyway, um, they had a call sign of WNP and P was North pole. Uh, the station, uh, was donated by Zenith corporation and Don mix, uh, from the ARL was sent as an operator. Uh, the, uh, the expedition was extremely successful in sending messages to the Newspaper Alliance, relaying amateur traffic and kept a record of amateur calls heard. Mix established a new DX record with his 200-meter station. When they returned, their 200-meter station was already outdated. Higher shortwave frequencies were possible along with voice operation. Okay, here's a picture of uh, several individuals, three in particular, checking out some of the equipment before the uh, Macmillan Polar Arctic Expedition of 1923. And uh, they're in Wisconsin, Maine at the time, and the home port of the schooner Bodine. And you can see that in the background. And ARL sponsors check out the, uh, the receiver furnished by Zenith for this expedition. And from left to right in the picture is uh, F.H. Chanel, 1MO, uh, Traffic Manager K.B. Warner, 9JT, Secretary Manager, and last but certainly not least, Harm Percy Maxim, 1AW, ARRL President.
So uh, imagine the excitement as they're checking out this stuff, getting ready to go on this very exciting uh, expedition. Here's some of the uh, key players, a uh, picture of them before they're heading out for the uh, expedition and uh, posing before uh, saying Bon Voyage. From left to right here, we have F.H. Chanel, uh, 1MO, uh, Don Mix, 1TS, and uh, Expedition Operator, and he's going to be using call sign WNP. And uh, he's the operator, and we also have Ken Warner, uh, to the right, 9JT. So three dapper-looking gentlemen <laughs> getting ready to uh, to uh, depart. And the only one that will be departing among that crew will be uh, Mr. Don Mix, uh, 1TS, because he's going to be the operator. Okay, in 1924... HPM president of the ARL was asked to represent the league at a meeting in Europe. And uh, this meeting was held in Paris and radio representatives of nine nations gave a dinner for HPM. Uh, Mrs. Maxim, uh, Josephine, uh, she served as an interpreter for this meeting. Uh, out of this meeting came the International Amateur Radio Union, IARU. So uh, that's when it all started in 1924. Uh, Maxim was made the chairman. Notice his elevated position as chairman in order to get things up and running. Continuing in that role on Easter holiday of 1925, HPM gave his closing comments. And this is just an abbreviation of his comments. I'll, I couldn't list them all, but the spirit of brotherhood that pervades amateur radio in America can be made to spread its mantle of good fellowship all over the civilized nations of the earth. So there you go. HPM was awarded an honorary doctor degree from a Colgate uh, University while giving the commencement address. So the subject was none other than radio. In 1925, things started moving up in the shortwave frequency bands. So now they were going from 200 meters to 50 meters. They were becoming popular. And as time continues, we know it just keep, kept going higher and higher as circuits and better vacuum tubes and things uh, presented themselves. On April 14th of 1925, Hiram Percy Maxim was elected the president of the first... International Amateur Radio Congress, and their meeting was in Paris, France. Uh, this event was represented by 25 nations, and there is a, a complete motion picture recording of this event, which is pretty interesting. Maxim dropped out of the manufacture of the gun silencers in 1925. He wanted to concentrate on industry operations um, with diesel and internal combustion engines. And he used that knowledge gained from the gun silencer to silent engines. Remember, he had an inversion to loud noises and things like that. So uh, it was just kind of a natural that he was going around silencing different things. And uh, the internal combustion engine made a lot of noise, and he made it a lot quieter with his uh, silencer, later termed muffler. Due to HPM's radio knowledge, he was commissioned as a lieutenant commander uh, in the United States Navy Reserve on June 19th, 1925. Uh, this occurred to his strong alliance that the Navy had with the ARL, educating them on short waves. So you can see the uh, prominence that ARL had with the Navy, and uh, that's who they came to, to be educated on this stuff because they were the hams were leading the way in 1925 uh, was the lieutenant commander Richard E. Byrd uh, Arctic expedition amateur operators and ARL assisted on most if not all of these expeditions uh, further testing was done examining the usefulness of shortwave radios in the Arctic sending out messages to and from the states and this was very very successful 
everybody saw the advantage of these short waves. In 1926, HPM uh, fitted the third floor of his silence or factory to make radio equipment. And uh, Clarence Tuska went on to form the Tuska Radio Company. And I had no idea, but that was actually on the third floor of HPM Silencer uh, Factory. So interesting. During 1926, the International Broadcast Union was trying to assign radio amateurs very low power. Uh, The AR prepared a rebuttal and was successful in blocking the low power requirement. Say again. Here again, a major success. In 1927, HPM, president of the AORL, represented the amateur radio operators at the International Radio Telegraph Conference held in Washington, D.C. Uh, this group was addressed by President Calvin Coolidge and Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, who was the president of the conference. It was learned that most of the other 74 nations in attendance thought that radio amateurs had little to no value. HPM and Charles uh, Stewart believed that uh, compromise was in order on the frequency allocations. So one of the concessions that was made, uh, they agreed to allow 400 kilocycles, now kilohertz, but kilocycles back then on 40 meters. And as all the amateurs know, currently we have 300 kilohertz, on 40 meters. So um, it would be interesting to know what happened to the other 100 kilohertz or kilocycles. But anyway, so uh, that was the compromise. So HPM knew when a compromise was in order, and he did that very well, and that uh, that served him well. Uh, following the conference in 1927, HPM was reflecting on the state of amateur radio. And he would often do this. He'd sit back in his chair and get out his pipe and just reflect on things. And a lot of those writings are written in QST magazine. And he was said, why did others fail and the AORL succeed? And it was that the AORL from the beginning was driven by the good for all and not a select few. And that was definitely one of HPM's guiding principles. On May 15, 1928, HPM was appointed as the Aviation Commissioner for the City of Hartford. Hiram Percy Maxson built a version of his silencer, which was six foot in diameter, to use as an experiment to convert salt water to fresh water. In 1929, the Depression hit, and it was disastrous for his silencer business. In 1930, HPM went to Washington to testify before the Interstate Commerce Committee to show the value of amateur radio to society. This was needed since a bill was introduced in the Senate to create a National Communication Commission to control all forms of wireless communication. HPM gave a very effective speech stating the value of the small group of frequencies that amateurs currently hold and taking those away would offer grave consequences. Due to a strong conviction delivered in the speech, the bill failed to pass. The speech went down in history as one of the best speeches ever for amateur radio. So here again, he goes to Washington, gives a speech, and gets what he wants. Incredible. October 23, 1930. The HPM firm had been developing the Maxim Window Silencer. When tested, it performed very well. This device was a combination fan and silencer. The New York Times stated in October 25, 1920, the following. Think of Hiram Percy Maxim walking along the noisiest city in the world with all the sound rippling away from him. He has silenced grinding machines, crackling rifles, muffled the roar of diesel engines. Then on October 1st of 1931, the Office of the Chief Operations of the United States Navy Department sent a letter to HPM requesting his picture. The Navy Department wanted to hang his picture next to Marconi, Bell, Faraday, and Morse. Shortly after the picture was requested in 1931, HPM received a letter from the then President Herbert Hoover of the United States requesting he attend a meeting of the President's Conference 
on home building and home ownership. So once again, you can see his tie in with the government and how often he was requested to go to Washington. QST in December of 1931 explained the origin of the word ham, saying it was derived from the British Cockney version of amateur, abbreviated into ham, further saying they are proud of it. <laughs> uh, with impression still going on, uh, this presented some challenging years for amateur radio. HPM continues as president of the ARL. He developed a very unique uh, writing style for himself. Actually, he had two writing styles. In his first instance, he writes beautifully phrased and inspirational editorials as fitting of the presiding genius of this technical field. In the second case, his writing signed T-O-M, which stood for The Old Man, was anybody's guess who that was. Prior to his death, only a few insiders knew it was HPM. TOM's writings were direct and forceful, without grace, and even offering torture with a wolf hang for those that disobeyed. He would often start his writings with, say, Say, son, now listen, trying to get people's attention right away. Topics dealing with rotten signals and operating procedures, including out-of-band operation with some of the subjects he addressed. He developed that writing to shame bad operators into becoming better operators. Most hams never forgot those pointed lectures from this old or the old man, T-O-M. HPM and his scholarly writings put great credence in the words, just supposers. Later, he used the word supposing in so much of his dialogue material. He embraced that word and used it often in his sentence structure for all his tremendous achievements that amateurs have accomplished. By just supposing, we broke into wireless immediately after Marconi showed us there was such a thing. By just supposing, we dug up what had to be done to make the useless 200-meter wave useful by working two-way across the Atlantic. By just supposing, we discovered that a strong brotherly spirit could be created out of which we built the ARL. By just supposing, we found out there was a way to work 40 meters, 10 meters, and 5 meters. We must continue by just supposing to keep conquering new fronts, both technically and also from an international human humanitarian perspective. In 1932, as HPM was growing older and amateur radio well-established, HPM remained president of the ARL. With less demands from the ARL, he developed an interest in Cosmos. I thought this was a great picture to show when Harm Percy Maxim was operating the ARL station W1MK. And every year, Mr. Maxim at W1MK at the ARL headquarters station annually sent the Navy Day broadcast. HBM's Cosmos interest led him to make a globe of Mars, which was one of his favorite planets to study and to begin to work on a book. In 1932, HPM wrote an article in Scientific America giving his thoughts on the significance of the cosmos. In 1933, his book, Life's Place in the Cosmos, was taking form. HPM said in 1933, we must see this through. It was this quality of inquiring persistence that made HPM a successful scientist and inventor. He still kept in touch with his amateur radio activities by con continuing his TOM writings. As mentioned earlier during these writings, he would talk about rotten fist, sending too many CQs, operating outside of the band, and faking a call. He threatened punishment as deemed necessary by the ARRL Torture Committee. And then on March of 1933, Herbert Hoover wrote a letter to HPM saying he was delighted that the ARL is making such progress. Herbert Hoover's son, Herbert Hoover Jr., was president of the ARL in 1962. His call sign was W6ZH. 
Okay, here shows a picture of HPM working on his Mars globe. And as the caption says, Mr. Maxim wrote and lectured on scientific subjects, particularly astronomy. He was greatly interested in Mars and had constructed a globe bearing all the known data on the markings appearing on that planet. On August 5, 1933, HPM addressed the ARL convention in Chicago. He mentioned communications with the planet Mars, further saying that he hoped that they will be amateur radio operators and members of the good old ARRL. On October 1933, a complete set of revisions for the Federal Radio Communications was completed. Operating procedures for amateurs largely remained unchanged. Three license forms were established and mobile operation along with informal portable setups were permitted. Expansion of knowledge and technique was moving rapidly. On June 19, 1934, was the radio passage of the Communication Act in which it created the Federal Communication Commission, replacing the former Federal Radio Commission. Even through the Depression years, there were many inventions, new techniques, and thousands of new operators. Amateur radio was doing well. HPM had a fearful time of saving his silencer company. With his wife's health failing, along with worry about his company, he was still able to carry on his duties as president of the ARL and the head of QST. In January of 1936, HPM and his wife Josephine planned a vacation trip to the Southwest. One of his visitation destinations was the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He had an invitation to make some planetary observations. Due to work stress, he was exhausted when he left for the trip. HPM became ill and was treated by a physician in Kansas City. His condition worsened and he was taken off the train in Colorado and put in a hospital. His family was summoned to the hospital and amateur radio operators set up relay stations back to the league to keep updated on his progress. Health progress was made, but on February 17, 1936, Hiram Percy Maxim sadly became a silent key. Early in 1936, HPM was presented with a new rig, but sadly never had a chance to use it. The transmitter remains at the ARL to this day. Nine days later, his wife Josephine passed away. Her health was not the greatest, but family believed she willed herself to die. She and HPM had a very close relationship as proof that they traveled together and they shared a lot of accomplishments together. She was truly his soulmate. They're both laid to rest in Hagerstown, Maryland, where Josephine was from. Amateur radio operators around the world observed 30 minutes of radio silence in his honor. On August 5th, 1938, HPM's memory was honored by the dedication of station W1AW at the ARL headquarters in West Hartford, Connecticut. The station was previously using W1MK. Here is the gravesite in Hagerstown, Maryland. You can see the uh, Hamilton and Maxim grave plot shown in the picture here. The uh, marker over on the right side was placed by the Hagerstown Amateur Radio Club. And we'll have uh, more on that on the next slide. In 1994, the Radio Association in Hagerstown celebrated the date of Hiram Percy Maxim's 125th birthday by a ceremony and placing a brass marker at his grave site. The ceremony was attended by surviving members of the Hamilton family and also local dignitaries. And this information comes from Al KZ3AB, who's a member of that club. Here's the uh, Hiram Percy Maxima official headstone. 
and you can see uh, right at the top of the headstone uh, his markings, and you can also see his wife's uh, Josephine's uh, inscriptions on the uh, on the headstone as well, just just down from that. HPM was truly the contributor during the start of amateur radio, and he continued in that capacity until his death. As an individual, his inventions were very diversified in nature. He was a great organizer of teams. If it was not for HPM and his relationship with governments around the world, it is likely that amateur radio would not exist today. Due to his relationships developed along the way, he was never defeated and won the respect of many for the good of amateur radio. The Department of Navy held him in such high regard, they placed his picture next to Marconi's. Organizations had strength and could accomplish greater things than individuals alone. HPM was multifaceted, handling many tasks and organizations at the same time. Intellectual levels were confirmed by him graduating from MIT at age 16. HPM believed that organization needed to be totally without selfishness, with no personal interest being served. His peers referred to him as the beloved gentleman. <laughs>